Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 9. We will read all 20 verses of this psalm, the ninth psalm. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He who does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of of daughter Zion, and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his acts of justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. But God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. Arise, Lord, do not let mortals triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, Lord. Let the nations know that they are only mortal. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let us pray together. Most gracious God, as we come before you this morning, we come to spend a few moments in meditation upon your word. Send your spirit among us, O God, that we might understand and apply your word to our lives. For Father, we ask this, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen. As we live life in this world, we become aware fairly quickly that there are a whole bunch of circumstances that happen in our lives that seem to be out of our control. There are good and wonderful times that that come upon us, and we wonder how we could have been so blessed. And then there are those hard and difficult times that come, and we wonder what we did to deserve them. And it seems as if we are constantly dealing with these realities. I can remember when I was in my teen years and attending high school that about this time of year I would begin to count the weeks and then the days until summer vacation came. And I'd be anticipating the coming of of that time of freedom. And sometime in about the middle of August, 
I begin to count the weeks and the days, longing for the day when I was back in school with my friends. It seemed like I was never satisfied. I found myself thinking once, oh, to be an adult and to be out of my parents' home and to be able to live my own life. About 10 years after I was out of my parents' home, I found myself longing for those days when I was back home and they were making all the decisions and paying all the bills and responsible for everything. I'm never satisfied. No matter what I face in life, I'm never satisfied. And so at times I find myself thinking, well, if I'm never satisfied, all I have to make sure I do is the right thing in every circumstance. The problem is, what is the right thing? Where do I receive wisdom to live this life? In the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter and the 26th verse, at the close of a section of, of that book of Genesis that had described creation and the fall of human beings into sin and the consequences of that sin in terms of Cain and Abel and, and all that came as a result of that and God's judgment upon his people, at the very end of the 26th verse of, of, of Genesis chapter 4, the Word of God makes this statement. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. It's almost as if the book of Genesis is saying to us, well, they've tried everything else. And things are just going from bad to worse in their experience. And so... At some point, they decide that to go back to the foundations of, of what God had created them to be, and they begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, that's in a way an extended introduction to this ninth psalm. Because when we look at a psalm, we always need to, to recognize that it falls within an extended book of prayers and worship songs that were prepared for the worship of God's people in the temple. We might be able to say that the book of Psalms is the only truly inspired worship songbook in existence. Every other hymn book, every other song book, bases its inspiration upon what the scriptures say. The Psalms were inspired by God. And they express the worship of God's people. If we were to study the book of Psalms carefully, one thing we would discover is that the Hebrew title for this book is Praises. It's not psalms, it's not hymns, it's not spiritual songs, it's praises. And, the, and those that wrote about the book of Psalms back in ancient days described how it took God's people from an experience of, of having to obey the laws and the commands of God because God required it, to a position where they obeyed those commands because they were delighting in them. It took people from obedience to praise. And the book of Psalms is organized in such a way to do that within our lives. Because those ancient scholars said that, the, that, that God's word, the book of Psalms, took us from obedience to praise through the experience of all of the brokenness and difficulty that we face in our lives. The reality is that for each of us, there's a dissatisfaction with life. 
because we recognize that on our own we fall short of the glory of God. And the psalmists took that dissatisfaction and they said, through this process, God is taking us from simple obedience to praise, from being forced to obey to delighting in God's law. And they do so, the Psalms do so, within the framework of an introduction and a conclusion. And this is all just still part of the introduction. But in the first Psalm, as an introduction to the book, the psalmist writes this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. For those that are memorizing the scriptures with our, our Sunday school, it should sound familiar. We're memorizing right now the first psalm. Blessed is that person whose delight. Notice he doesn't say who is forced to obey the law of God. He's wanting to establish what the principles are. Whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates upon that law day and night. That person, and then the psalmist says, let me illustrate. That person, let me use an image. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Imagine the, the imagery that he's presenting. Here's a tree, and it's planted near a stream of water, and it's receiving an abundance of nourishment drawn out of the soil that is saturated with that water, and the tree is healthy and blessed. The other side of the illustration is not so the wicked. They are like the chaff. They are that tree that is planted far away from the water, who receives no nourishment, who is in dry soil, and they wither up and they die and they are blown away like the chaff. The psalmist is saying, this is the illustration of life. The one who is meditating upon God's law in which they delight is receiving nourishment. And bit by bit, God is taking them from simple obedience through the experiences of their lives to delight in him and praise of him. I said that that was the introduction. The conclusion to the book of Psalms is four Psalms that remind us constantly of what it means to praise God. Within the book of, excuse me, within the book of um, Psalms, there are five books, five separate sections. And each of those sections is divided into smaller sections. The section that we're concerned with today in Psalm 9 is a section of, of a number of psalms. In fact, I believe it's about eight psalms. It starts in, in Psalm 3 and takes us right to Psalm 14. And it's divided in a very particular way. That Psalms 3 through 8 are the first half of that section. And scholars tell us that there are, in the Hebrew language, 64 poetic lines in that section. Psalms 9 through 14 are the second half of it, and scholars tell us that there's 64 poetic lines there as well, taking us from the beginning and the ending to those, those psalms. And each section is summarized with a final psalm that focuses our attention upon what God's message is. These first psalms all have to do with the difficulty of life and how we respond to it. And they call out this attitude that people in general have 
which is to live their lives as if God does not exist. The first half ends with this statement, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. The focus is upon the praise of God. The second half ends with this powerful statement in Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are evil. And as the psalm works its way down, it says, oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Two sections, equal to one another, dealing with the questions of our difficulties in life. And the psalmist is saying, what we need to recognize is that God is in all of those things. And his purpose is to lead us to praise, to lead us to rejoice in him. The Apostle James certainly understood this because as he begins his letter in the first chapter and the second verse, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you fall into manifold trials and temptations. Because the testing of your faith produces all kinds of godly blessings. And if you need wisdom, ask of God in faith and he will provide it, because God is gracious to do that. James understood what these psalms were saying. Well, to focus our attention on the ninth psalm, which begins the second half of this introductory, introductory section, the psalmist gives us three points that we will touch upon briefly. The first of which is, he calls us to praise God. He calls us to understand that in the midst of the life that we are called to lead, in all of the difficulty that we're facing, we are to praise God because God is a God who gives hope to the hopeless. Verses 1 and 2 introduce that thought, and then verses 11 through 14 reinforce it. It's as if the, the psalmist is dividing his psalm into these two points, but he's doing so in a twofold way. So what he says is that we are to praise God, that we are to praise God in the midst of the difficulties that we are facing, and that we are then to praise God because God gives hope to the hopeless. So first of all, he calls us to praise God. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. And then down in verses 11 to 14, he continues to call us to praise. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. And the praise turns personal, a personal prayer. Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of daughter Zion and there rejoice in your salvation. Twofold praise. First of all, he says in the first two verses that the foundation of praise is in delighting in God and his purposes in our lives. I will give thanks 
to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all his wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in him. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. That we are to give praise to God because of his name, which he has placed among us, which means his presence, his personality. He himself. When the people of Israel were leaving Egypt and heading towards the promised land, God said to them, my presence will go with you. And in that presence, you will discover who I am. Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says, no, I can't show you all my glory. I can show you part of it. I have to hide you from the most of it. But what you will see will be my presence, my name, who I am. We are called to rejoice in the name of our God. In verses 11 and 12, he calls us to praise in the one who is enthroned in Zion. And to proclaim among the nations what he has done. How does the world know that God is powerfully at work, redeeming and cleansing and restoring and reconciling people to himself? They know it because they see it in us. As we are moved from simple obedience to delighting in God and in his grace, in the midst of his circumstances, Job says, even though he slay me, I will praise him. We are called to prayer and to praise because God is gracious to us. We are called to bring our needs to the Lord because he is at work in those needs, showing us himself. So the psalmist begins with a call to praise the Lord. But then he takes us deeper, because so often we see praise as something that removes us from reality. There was a saying when I was a an undergraduate student at, at McMaster University, and I was heading towards studying at the Divinity College, which was a graduate program. And so as a consequence, I would attend the chapel services at that Divinity College and got to know many of the professors. And there was a saying that regarding one particular professor that he always seemed to be so joyful. He rode around the campus on a bicycle, and the saying was that here was a man who could fall off his bicycle and get up rejoicing. Well, I saw it one day. I was in my residence room, and I just happened to be looking out the window as he was going by on his bicycle, and he hit a bump and fell off, and he got up with a big smile on his face, rejoicing. We sometimes referred to that as being separated from reality. Because it didn't seem normal to us. And sometimes we think that. People who praise God in the midst of their circumstances are removed from reality. But the psalmist says no. They are deeply rooted in the reality of their lives. Because as the psalmist calls us to praise God, he says this, my enemies turn back. He brings our attention to the difficulties that he as a godly person was facing. That he had enemies. That they were causing great consternation in his life. But that was the very ground on which praise grows. It's not a separation from reality. It's a facing that difficulty 
knowing that the Lord has a purpose and a plan for it. So the psalmist says, let's think as we're praising about the difficulties that we face in life. And let's recognize that those difficulties often expose sin. They often expose our need for maturity. They bring us to grasp hold of God and hold on to his promises and his purposes because we know that he is at work and his purpose is to mature us in such a way that we live by praise in him. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Notice he doesn't say rejoice in your circumstances. Rejoice that everything is falling apart. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, Paul says. Rejoice. And here's the reason. The final point that the psalmist makes. Perhaps the key point in the entire psalm is that our God is a God who gives hope to the afflicted. Verses 7 to 10, the Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. In other words, he's fair. He's just. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, Those who know your name, those who have encountered the presence of God, who know him as he really is, trust him. They trust him in the circumstances of their lives, for they know this certain fact, the Lord, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Psalmist says we're called to be people who are seeking God. And if we are seeking God, we will find him. That he will not forsake those who are seeking him. I just want to draw your attention to one scripture that helps us to understand this. This is a scripture that's quoted in the book of Romans. But I will read it from its original location in the book of Isaiah, the or the 65th chapter and the first verse, where Isaiah writes this, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me, that to a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. The Apostle Paul quotes this in Romans to describe the mystery and the wonder of God's grace. We might read it and we might say, well, God is being unfair there. He's he's being found by those who are not seeking him. What he is actually saying here is that from our point of view, they look like they're not seeking because they're not part of our group or our nation, but they are seeking to know God. God. And Isaiah writes and he says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me to a nation that did not call on my name, which by the way is you and I. Those who were considered in the Old Testament world as Gentiles. That's who he's referring to. God says this, And here's the literal translation. God says, behold me. Behold me. All day long, verse 2, I held out my hands to obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. There's where we were pursuing our own ends. The psalmist says, 
as we're pursuing those ends, those things that are for us alone, God is reaching out to us. And what do we discover? That if we turn to him, we will always find him faithful. We will always find him at work in our lives. As the psalmist brings his psalm to a close, he says this, beginning in verse 17, the wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God, but God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. It's as if the psalmist is saying, here's the whole purpose of this call to praise that we will see in reality that God is a God who reaches into the lives of the broken and the hopeless and restores hope. Philip Jenkins, <coughs> excuse me, Philip Jenkins in his book, God's Continent, which is a discussion of, of the, the regrowth of Christianity in Europe, makes this statement about where that continent currently is in terms of its faith in God. He says, once ordinary believers can now assert with great confidence that the state is my shepherd, that they've put their faith in the wrong thing. That they are looking to human solutions to their difficulties. Contrast that with an encounter between a speaker and, a, and an audience member at a church growth conference. And by the way, the speaker at the time was speaking about the use of techniques in order to get people into church. And the technique he was describing was how at a church that he was serving, they decided that they were going to set the Guinness World Book of Records for the largest ice cream Sunday ever consumed by a group of people. He said they had a, a, a huge bowl that they made in their parking lot filled with ice cream and all of the fillings. And he says, a crowd gathered to consume it. And he says, then we preached the gospel to them. But then he said this, upon our questioning him about whether that was a good process to, to follow, he said this, he says, you know, he says, as a pastor and as a leader, I'm good. He says, I'm real good. He says, I, I can, can motivate churches, but he says, one thing I can't do is I can't raise the dead. A little guy stands up at the back, puts his hand up, stands up, and he says, yes, but sir, he says, I know someone who can. And that's the difference between simply relying upon human solutions to all of our difficulties and problems and coming before God and in prayer and in praise saying, I know someone who raises the dead. I know someone who gives hope to the hopeless. Notice how the psalmist puts it. But God will never forget the needy. Literally what he says is, God will never forsake those and forget those who are in a hopeless situation. In Mark chapter 2 verse 17, as Jesus is being questioned, Regarding his life and his ministry, he says this, it is not the well that need the physician, it is the sick. It is the broken. It is the needy. It is the hopeless. The psalmist says, we praise God 
Because as we encounter him in the circumstances that we are facing in our lives, we find that he gives most hope to those who have come to the end of every solution that they could have thought of. And they call upon the name of the Lord. So in this ninth psalm, as the psalmist is leading us from simple obedience to delighting in God's law, praising God, he asks us the question, are you hopeless? Are you coming to God with the deep awareness that everything in your life is failing in one way or another. Years ago, and we'll close with this illustration, years ago, I read a a biographical article regarding Brian Mulroney. And I think it was at the time that he was um, the Prime Minister of Canada. And the article said that Brian Mulroney, being Irish, was firmly committed to an Irish proverb regarding the basis of his life. And that proverb was, sooner or later, life will break your heart. From a human point of view, we can say that that's a statement of the truth. Sooner or later, our hearts will be broken. But from a biblical point of view, we simply say, praise the Lord. Because it's in that brokenness of heart that we find him. It's at that point that we see that his grace is made perfect in our weakness. And that is the thing that we are called to cling to. Psalmist says to us, let's begin to move. Move from simply trying to do the right thing, to delighting in God's law and meditating upon it and finding in that law the one that it reveals who gives hope to the hopeless. Let us pray together. Father, as we come before you today, we confess that in so many ways in our lives, we find ourselves wrestling with that feeling of dissatisfaction. We keep wondering whether things will be better. We keep seeking out better circumstances. And we try to avoid those difficulties that we face in life. But, Father, you keep calling us to experience you in the reality of our lives, to experience the hope that you give and the grace that you pour out upon our lives, to find in you the one who redeems us and reconciles us to the Father. And, Father, that we do that through faith through believing what you have promised to us in Christ. Draw us to yourself today, Father, and cause us to praise and to worship your great name. For, Father, we ask this through the name of our Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen.